Every single one of you need to know how to run an AR. Load it, unload it, hit a paper plate at 25 yards, happy meal. Every single one of you right now need to know how to shoot an AK-47. Pick it up, load it, unload it, paper plate, 25 yards. Why would I want that client? I don't own one. Well, it doesn't mean you won't fight with one. Hey everyone, James with TFB TV. Welcome back to the How to Win the Fight series. This is a series that I filmed in summer 2019 at Thunder Ranch with living training legend Clint Smith. Essentially, this series focuses on using the AR-15, or any carbine for that matter, but primarily the AR-15 for personal defense. The foundation of this series of videos is on the Thunder Ranch urban rifle course. In episode one, we kind of went over urban rifle, what it was, the purpose of it. And in episode two, we're going to talk about the ultimate urban rifle. Now, before we start fighting with each other about what the ultimate urban rifle is, let's kick this bitch off with a drinking story. TriggerCon, you guys know it. It's a convention that we go to, TFB TV has gone to the past couple of years, it takes place in Bellevue, Washington, two, three blocks away, there is a Marriott. That Marriott, if you go there after TriggerCon, everyone who was working TriggerCon will be there boozing. I was walking around there last year, and I am like pretty much after every show. You've got vendors walking around, you got guys from the press. There's this dude there who's really cool. His name's Chris Costa. You may not have heard of him, but he's huge in Japan. But I'd see these guys in the lobby, the dudes from Arrow, Clint Hansen from Ballistic Advantage Barrels, and you know what happens. After you've had like 19 beers with your buddies, you're like, dude, I got a great idea. Awesome idea for a video, man. We're going to go to the top of Mount Everest. We're going to take a Jeep up there, a bunch of hookers. We're going to get a hot tub up there and guns, and we're going to shoot it. And we're going to post it all over Instagram. And we're going to do a video, and it's going to be awesome. And we do that every year. And it's like, dude, Arrow, you guys need to do an event. I'll cover it. I'll go. I'll go do the event. And that's what you say right? When you're chatting with your buddies after you've been drinking all night, you come up with these grand plans with zero intention the next morning to follow through. You wake up, you're like, God damn, I hope they don't call me. Lo and behold, last spring, I get a phone call from the guys at Arrow and they're like, dude, we're putting on that event. You know, that thing we've been talking about. And I'm like, God damn it. And they're like, it's going to be at Thunder Ranch. I'm like, I'm in. And I'm kidding. Of course, those guys, they could have had it in the Denny's parking lot and I still would have shown up because I love those dudes. Arrow knew I've never owned one of the rifles, so the entire purpose, I think, was to get me up there, build an Arrow rifle piece by piece under their supervision and with their help, and then run the absolute shit out of it during Clint Smith's urban rifle course. And that's what I did. We ran this exact rifle that you've seen on a few of the videos from this series already. Ran this rifle around 1,000, 1,200 rounds through it over the course of three days without cleaning it after it was assembled. Needless to say, I was incredibly impressed. And to be fair, at the end of the course, they let me keep the rifle. But at no point did they say, James, we fully expect you to make a video about this rifle and to pump it up. So I'm doing this of my own accord because I learned a lot. And we're not going to be talking just about this Aero rifle. We're going to be talking about the ultimate urban rifle or urban carbine generally, although this is going to be geared towards the AR-15. Before we start talking about why this is the ultimate urban rifle build, why should you take my word for it? I'm just some dumb idiot on YouTube. That's true, but as it turns out, I had a lot of help from very experienced people. That is Clint Smith, of course, at Thunder Ranch. He kind of put together the entire concept. You had Clint Hansen of Ballistic Advantage, and you had the guys from Arrow. And they came up with kind of a package. They said, James, this is kind of where we think the ultimate urban rifle is. And here's some components we think that would work. Why don't you pick them out, figure out how you like to configure your rifle, but stick with this general concept. So how do you define the ultimate urban rifle? You do not have to fight anyone competent today in a fight to get hurt really bad if they have any what you and I would call contemporary cartridges. For example, 545 Russian, 762 39, 308, 30-06, okay? All those calibers are military calibers. Those calibers are basically simple. The reason I want 100 yards zero is I know that when you shoot at 200 yards, your bullet will only drop a nominal two, four inches, okay, with your 223. 
And I also know when we go to 300, you're going to drop a nominal 13 inches. So that means the average size of the average man on the fucking planet today is five foot eight inches tall. So if you hold center on that bitch, okay, we're going to shoot him here. We're going to shoot him here. They're going to shoot him in the dick. Awesome. I'll take it. Neuter him and tutor him. Okay? But it's not personal, right? So the deal with it is this person that you fight doesn't have to do anything. All they have to do is pick up this shitty $40 AK, point it at you, and pull the trigger, and you're in jeopardy. Two things happen past 300 that are good things. One, the bullet now starts to drop a nominal 30 inches, and two, based on what bullet it is, the wind will start to move it around a little bit. So you, in your world, need to own, with your car, length of your car, farthest distance you can see in your house, and everything else after that is gravy, and I would say that you should be able to hit stuff, okay, on a five foot, eight inch man, okay, you should be able to hit him someplace out to 300 yards. And that's what we did in the urban rifle course. We started at pistol ranges, and by the last day, we're shooting man-sized targets all the way out to 500 yards. So it needs to be reasonably accurate. You want it to be lightweight. You want to have the ability to mount accessories, to mount optics that are going to maintain zero, to have good ergonomics. Those are the main considerations, but primarily you want it to be effective from pistol range all the way out to 500 meters. But you don't want it to be too big or too heavy. You want to be able to use it inside confined spaces like say your home. So that was the concept. And one of the most critical elements for that, which is what we're about to talk about, is the barrel. Everyone generally agreed that 14 and a half to 16 inches was kind of the ultimate compromise in terms of barrel. Yes. Good. Three inches from the top, left and right, perfect. Okay, number five. Of course, you could go longer and you can get something that'll get greater distance, but it's gonna be heavier, it's going to be a little bit less wieldy, if that's a word, the opposite of unwieldy. And you could go shorter, but the main problem, not only do you lose velocity and lose range, but you lose lethality with the 5.56 round. The 223 derives its effectiveness from fragmentation. Fragmentation is functionally breaking apart inside of a soft target. That creates a larger permanent wound cavity, and that is where the 5.56-223, that's where it gets its power. In order for a 223 round to fragment, it needs to be moving at about, and at least, 2,500 feet per second. With an AR-15, you need at least a 10-inch barrel. That's going to put you at 2,600 feet per second at the muzzle you drop below 2,500 feet per second a little bit after just 50 yards. So you lose a great deal of lethality after 50 yards if you're using a 10 inch barrel, sure. They look cool, yes, absolutely. You can LARP around your house like you're a SEAL or something, like you've got your Mark 18. But you're looking at a carbine that's going to be far less effective outside of 50 yards, and you also have a lot lower range. At 375 yards, a 55 grain round from a 10 inch AR-15, like say a Mark 18, will have dropped three feet already. Let's compare that to a 16 inch barrel. You're looking at 3,200 feet per second at the muzzle. So 600 feet per second faster out of the 16 inch barrel. It's still moving at 2,500 feet per second at 200 yards. So you still get fragmentation, larger permanent wound cavity at out to 200 yards. And while out of a 10 inch barrel, a 55 grain 223 round has dropped three feet at 375 yards, you don't drop three feet until 450 yards with the 16 inch barrel. A 16 inch gun isn't going to be as light or as handy as like a super fucking cool Navy SEAL 10 inch AR-15. It isn't like you're slinging around an M1 Grand either. There are several other things that are really important in terms of your barrel, but I'm only going to kind of gloss over them. I encourage you, I highly encourage you to research these topics. Profile, that is what is the shape of the barrel? You've got several profiles that are popular. Some of the most common being H-bar or heavy barrel. That's like a thick barrel that's pretty much a uniform diameter the entire length of the barrel. Upsides of the heavy barrel, they tend to be more accurate because they're less susceptible to barrel whip or I guess harmonic distortion would be the correct term. That is the barrel wanting to kind of flex and whip whenever you're firing it. If you look at an ultra slow-mo video, that does actually happen. Heavy barrels are more resistant to that, but they are heavy. They actually weigh a ton. It'll surprise you if you pick up like a pencil barrel gun next to a heavy barrel gun the weight difference, even if the barrel lengths are the same. So number two, 
pencil barrel. I'm a big fan of the lightweight profile. That's usually a uniform diameter, just like the heavy barrel, all the way through the entire length of the barrel, but it's a lot lighter, it's a lot thinner. What does that mean? It's going to be more susceptible to barrel whip. Perhaps accuracy is going to be decreased. It's certainly going to be more susceptible to the negative effects of heat accumulation whenever you're firing. So you got the pencil, you got the heavy, in the middle you got the medcon or the medium contour. This is primarily seen in stainless steel barrels. You also have perhaps one of the most popular profiles out there, the M4 profile, which I think for civilians is generally useless. With the M4 profile, it starts out thick near the chamber, which is good, but then it gets thinner towards the middle of the barrel. There's a, a shoulder there. That's primarily used for mounting an M203 grenade launcher, which unfortunately I don't have and you probably don't either. Then it gets thicker again towards the end of the barrel. I went with the Hansen profile, which is named after Clint Hansen. He came up with it. Very simple design. It's a shoulderless design. It starts out thick at the chamber where the most heat's going to be, so that makes a lot of sense. And then it kind of tapers out to a medium contour as it moves along the length of the barrel. So this is hands down my favorite barrel profile. Should I say Hansen down? No, it was bad. That was a bad one. I'm sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Barrel materials, you've got primarily 4140, 4150. 4150 is what you're going to see in most mil-spec guns. Then you've got your stainless steels, 410 stainless, 416 stainless. I will let you guys look into that. I used a stainless steel barrel. I've heard scuttlebutt is that stainless steel barrels are softer than the 4140 or 4150 steels. I'm not sure if that's true anymore with modern machining and modern heat treating. Maybe it's the case, maybe not. I guess go ask somebody from Ballistic Advantage. But I do know that stainless steel tends to be a lot more accurate than your standard like CMV barrels. Then you've got twist rate, you've got faster twist, which is in mil-spec guns, so like military M4s are going to be using one in seven. That's used for stabilizing heavier grain weights of ammo. You've got one in nine, that's a slower twist that's very common in the commercial market. That's better, of course, for stabilizing lighter rounds, like 45 grain, 55 grain. Then you have what I selected for this barrel, and what I select as often as I can for all my barrels, one in eight twist, which is like God's twist. Like why the fuck is anybody dicking around with one in seven and one in nine when you've got one in eight that's right there that can stabilize everything from 45 grain up to like 77 grain, like the entire range. I don't understand it, and for some reason it's super popular in stainless steel barrels, but nothing else. I went with a mid-length gas system. This is a 16-inch gun. It's not a 14 and a half inch gun. So I can extend my gas block out like another inch and a half, have a softer recoil impulse, and it's still gonna work just as well as a 14 and a half with a carbine length, or even better than, say, the 16-inch barrel with a carbine length gas system. I can further elaborate on that point, but it's really boring, so I suggest if you're, really, if you're into it, you want to know more about mid-length versus carbine, I would say uh, hit Google. There's a wealth of information out there. Finally, for barrel, you need to decide about your muzzle device. You've got a flash hider, which is going to do nothing more than suppress the flash, the muzzle flash from your gun. You've got muzzle brakes. Now, muzzle brakes, I, this is my first muzzle brake. I never had a muzzle brake on a 223 because I'm like, look, these things don't have a ton of recoil, but holy moly. I used the VG6 Epsilon 556 when I was shooting at Thunder Ranch. Couldn't believe how little recoil. Like, you wouldn't think that the 223 could have less recoil. It certainly can with a muzzle brake, but your drawbacks are, these things are loud as piss. Three. Nice. And they throw debris and shrapnel and crap and 90 degree angles. So that's your major downside. I am truly terrified to fire this thing in my house. Clint does a great job of explaining why. That muzzle brake is awesome. It's, it basically quells the stunning recoil of the 223 rifle. They're cool, but they're loud. Now imagine shooting that bitch in that hallway without no ear pro. You look like Elmer Fudd in a Bugs Bunny movie smack the tree. Here's what happens like if you shoot that shit, this is what happens immediately after you pull the trigger. Bang! Ah! In your ear for about two weeks.
Handguards. We'll handle this quickly, even though it's a very important component. Get a free floating handguard. Free floating means that the handguard doesn't touch the barrel at any point. So if you were to rest this handguard on a barricade, you don't have to worry about shifting point of aim, point of impact. Get one that's lightweight. If you get one that's too heavy, you're going to be miserable. Make sure you've got accessory mounting options. M-Lock, which is what this Atlas S1 from Aero, that's what it comes with. M-Lock was invented by Magpul. It basically won the format wars. It is the VHS to the key mod beta cassette tape. So key mod that was introduced by BCM, that did not pan out so well. People found that they liked M-Lock more. M-Lock has been more successful and you're seeing fewer and fewer key mod handguards be introduced. You also have the old faithful Picatinny rail, which is still used by the military. You can get that quad rail, right? But that's gonna be heavier, and I'm a big fan of the M-Lock because it allows you to have a narrow in diameter, easier to hold, easier to control handguard. So M-Lock, in my opinion, is hands down the way to go. I am going to absolutely 1,000% shill for the Atlas S1 handguard. I will tell you factually, this is probably my most favorite handguard. The Atlas S1 forgoes full length Picatinny rail. You only have a little bit of rail up front for your front sight, and then you've got a little bit of rail here in the back to lengthen your upper receiver Picatinny rail to give you more sighting options. Having QD sling points like this one is also nice. I've got two QD sling points at the base here, and I added an M-Lock QD sling point at the muzzle end. The worst thing about a tactical sling is if you bend over, the muzzle has a tendency to go over here. The end of your muzzle, okay, and a penis have something in common. If you don't know where they're at all the time, you're gonna get in trouble regardless of your gender. What is the best optic for an urban rifle? Something you're going to be using close up and far away. An LPVO, a low power variable optic. EOTech sent along Voodoo's, the EOTech Voodoo. This is the 126X. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I believe they make a 1 to 8X, but it's got this little throw lever here so you can quickly drop to a true 1x. So that means you can shoot both eyes open. I can see my reticle right now with both eyes open. Great eye relief, very clear glass. And if I want to, I can chuck it all the way up to 6x, which made it very easy to shoot at 500 yards. Don't just run it up to six and be a happy meal with it. Run that thing halfway through the day, okay, down to three. Then half for an hour, run it down to one. Learn what that looks like. Okay, understand what's going on. There's also a little set of buttons over here that allow you to illuminate the reticle, which I thought was cool. It'll turn, the whole thing will turn red. I could not be more impressed with this optic for that matter. And I absolutely treated this thing like straight up dog shit. We were banging it against barricades, using it like in our one-handed malfunction clearing drills and one-handed reloading drills. You know, you're using it to jam against an, an object to get tension on your rifle so you can manipulate it if you have to. And it did not lose zero, it stayed in place. We used EOTech's quick disconnect mount. It, it worked flawlessly. I mean, I, I don't know what else I can say about this optic. And I've got several LPVOs. This one's gotta be one of my favorites. It's a bit pricey, but I think it's worth it. You guys, I mean, you have to understand you gotta spend money on good glass. As a guy who absolutely hated that, like my philosophy is, why am I gonna spend money on glass when I can just buy another gun? It makes your life so much easier. It's truly worth it. And like my days of buying cheap glass, Chineseium, way behind me. Another very technical aspect of the AR-15 that I'm just gonna gloss over, but please don't ignore it, is the bolt carrier group. The bolt carrier group is like the soul of your AR-15. Is it going to drastically affect the performance the way a barrel or a trigger would or an optic? Absolutely not. However, if your bolt breaks, you are fucked. I highly recommend before you purchase a complete upper or a bolt carrier group, instead of just buying the cheapest one you can find or one that just says mil spec, Look into what bolt carrier groups are good and what makes a bolt carrier group good. You're looking at composition like Carpenter 158 steel, which is mil spec. You want your gas key. You want to make sure it's staked properly. You want to have a bolt that's high pressure tested and magnetic particle inspected. If the things I just said made absolutely no sense to you, instead of me spending 10 minutes explaining it in this video, which has already run kind of long, Trust me, just look it up on Google, do the research, it'll take you 30, 45 minutes of reading and you're gonna be caught up just like that.
For trigger, I use the Rise Armament APT. I like nice triggers. I have very rarely spent additional money on nice triggers. The guys with Rise Armament supplied it for the class. I was super impressed and I think everybody else was too. It really helps you send the shot, if you know what I mean. I weighed this in at between three and a quarter, three and a half pounds whenever I was screwing around with it. The trigger's heavy enough where you have to intentionally pull the trigger to send it. You know, it's not like a two pound trigger, but it's also light enough where it's not going to disturb your shot whenever you actually pull the trigger. I've never understood people paying like 200 bucks for a trigger. I did whenever I shot this thing out at Thunder Ranch. Backup iron sights are very important. You should know how to use your iron sights. If something happens with your optic, your optic goes down, you break it or whatever. I like having a QD mount on my optic. So this EOTech Voodoo has a QD mount. If something happens to the optic, you can just rip the lever on the QD mount, chuck the optic, and you've got your backup iron sights. Know how to use them. I'm not married to a particular iron sight, backup iron sight, like I think Magpul makes great ones. I think Troy makes excellent sights. Brownell sent Magpul Embus Pro. Not the Embus Plastic, but the Embus Pro. I've broken plastic sights and I've dinged steel sights too in the past. Metal sights tend to be a lot more durable than plastic. So that's probably the route you should go. Don't be afraid to splurge on, on getting nice iron sights. If you ask Clint Smith what needs to be in your urban rifle, he's gonna tell you good backup iron sights, and a white light. So right now I've got the Surefire X300 Ultra. I just paid for this with my own money. I've also got the Surefire Scout series of lights. The M300C seen in this video has an output of 500 lumens, a runtime of one hour, but it's only four inches long and 1.125 inches in diameter. It weighs four ounces with batteries. I like those a lot and I believe in my interview with Clint Smith, he said that he likes the Surefire Scout as well. Furniture, just get what works for you. I just use Cheapo Magpul MOE, just like they're basic. This would probably be the set for like the grip and the stock would be 80 bucks. Just find what you like. Gotta have good magazines. Everybody knows Magpul makes a great magazine, plus the FDE blended in perfectly with this Duracoat job on this arrow. Now, as I said, I had not previously owned any aero rifles. And now at this point I have, I think two, um, including this one. Because I was so impressed with how well these ran out at Thunder Ranch. You had 10 people out there taking the course. All of them were using aero rifles. I didn't see a single malfunction. Everybody shot probably a thousand rounds of ammo. So 10,000 rounds through 10 different rifles. And mine shot one to two inch groups with relatively inexpensive 45 grain frangible ammo. I shot this rifle three days in a row, didn't clean it, didn't lube it, and it ran flawlessly. I had no issues with it the entire time and it shot very well. I had a preconceived notion about Aero because of how inexpensive they were. Again, I knew they were solid dudes. I knew that they had solid manufacturing facilities but I was still reluctant just because of the price. Like it was, it was too cheap and that's stupid. And you guys call me out on it all the time. It's fair. I'm one of those people, I'm a sucker. This shot as well as any other AR-15 that I have, probably have almost 20 AR-15s, uh, almost all of them more expensive than this one. And this one shoots as good as anything else that I've got in the stable. I've had longstanding professional and personal relationships with the guys at EOTech and Aero and Ballistic Advantage and Brownells, and they're all great companies. So I'm really glad that they included me uh, in this little trip. If you like this content, please consider supporting us at subscribestar.com slash TFBTV or the slightly anti-gun Patreon at patreon.com slash TFBTV. I wish everyone from Patreon would switch over to supporting us at Subscribestar, their very pro-gun platform. We are viewer supported. The money that you guys send in to Patreon, Subscribestar, whatever, that goes to pay for our expenses, uh, pay our personalities, and fortunately, we don't have to take a check from sponsors. I didn't have to say, hey, Aero, where's the money? Where's the check, babe? You want me to come do a video for you guys? I need some money. We don't have to do that because you guys support us. Because we're viewer supported, we can be independent and we can bring you more great content like this. So thanks a ton for watching. Stay tuned for more how to win the fight content from Thunder Ranch.